This presentation will be on modular buildings made from repurposed shipping containers. It has been written by George Runkle, PE, for a graduate course at Columbia University, CIEN 9109, Civil Engineering Research Project, as part of my pursuit of a Master of Science in Civil Engineering. This presentation is for Columbia University, New York, New York. What we'll cover in today's presentation are the following subjects. What is a shipping container? Who builds with the containers? A history of modular buildings, brief history. Recent container projects, how building is actually built with containers, why would we want to build with containers, and what we see as future trends used in this medium of construction. The intermodal container, let's start out with its history and exactly what it is, so we understand the terms. Containerized cargo can be loaded onto trucks, rail cars, and ships, and there's very little labor involved. It's pretty quick, and there's less theft. In the old days, back in the century and before, we used to load all our cargo in what they call a brake bulk method. And here's a good example in this photograph of longshoremen loading barrels onto a ship. And as you see, each barrel has to be handled individually. They do have somewhat of a crane here to help them manhandle it onto the ship. But after it's put on the ship, they have to manually push the barrels into position either in the hold or up on the deck and lash them down. It's time consuming, very expensive because the amount of labor that's involved. And also the ship spends quite a bit of time in port waiting to be loaded and unloaded which costs the ship owner money. He's not making money while the ship is sitting there being loaded and unloaded. Now over here we've got a more modern container ship here getting loaded at a container facility. And all that happens is the containers are bought by truck or rail to the facility, staged on the dock, lifted by the crane over and either set down below here in the hold of the ship or up on the deck. They're locked in place and the ship is ready to go out. Unloading is just as easy. They're simply lifted off the deck or out of the hold, brought back, dropped on the dock, and the container ship then can be reloaded and be on its way. And it's very uh, quick, saves a lot of time, and of course it's harder to steal stuff out of a shipping container since they're locked and sealed. Now, in the 20th century, there was a number of attempts to try to uh, develop shipping containers and containerized shipping. Um, none of them really got going. The first successful introduction was by Malcolm McLean, who owned a large trucking company in the U.S. What Malcolm McLean did is he bought an old T2 World War II tanker, the Ideal X, and he modified it by putting a deck on top where they could load the shipping containers and lock them down. This company became Sealand Services, and it was later purchased by Maersk Lines. Introduction of shipping containers really revolutionized shipping because you needed much less labor now to load ships. You needed much less piers to take them in. They spent less time in port, and more cargo could be carried cheaper. Now, the problem is, is when we get our shipping containers, and this is the problem that happened prior to Malcolm McLean, is we need to standardize the container. So our ships are all manufactured the same way to take the containers. You don't want to have different types of containers all over the place and only certain ships are able to take them. Same applies with the rail cars that they go on to. You want to be able to design your rail cars to take a standard shipping container so you can use the same rail cars for every container that comes in, not to have a different rail car for each different type of container that shows up from different shipping lines. And the same applies to trucks. So what we have here is here's a rail car and notice it's a 53 foot long rail car but it's still able to take two 20 foot shipping containers. This one here on the left is a tank container. We're not concerned with them. They're not really that good for making a building out of. Over here on the right though is the Series 1 general cargo container. That's what we're interested in. This is a 20 foot, what's known as a 20 foot container. And these types of containers are what we do, use to fabricate buildings out of. Now, <clears throat> one of the issues that we have to make sure we understand 
is containers come in standard sizes. Obviously, you want to do that so it fits on the different types of uh, modes of shipping. Your standard width for your international shipping container is 8 foot. All these basically work out to imperial measurements because these were developed originally in the U.S. Standard heights of the containers are 8 foot high. That's called the standard cube and 9.5 feet, which is the high cube. The lengths in the most common containers are as I'm showing here, 20 foot through 53 foot. What I have to point out though, the 48 foot, 53 foot are eight and a half foot wide. So it makes using them for buildings not too suitable because they're not matching in with the rest. There's also some issues with how the 48s and the 53 foots are fabricated, which makes them difficult to use in standard buildings. For building pro purposes, generally the 40 foot high cube container is best because it's of its large size and its simple construction. Alright, now the standards. What standards do we use when we manufacture shipping containers? There's three that are very important. 668, ISO 668. That's your dimensions and the ratings of the containers, how much they're supposed to carry as far as cargo with weight, what their maximum weight can be when they're fully loaded. That's very important because the dimensions, obviously, we need to know what dimensions we're working with when we're designing a building. 1161 is important. That's our corner fitting specification. That The corners are cast steel. The diagram is shown here. That allows us to lock the containers together using commercially available fittings. We'll go more into that as we go forward. And then, of course, Series 1 containers, freight container specifications and testing. And that is how you test the containers for the different loads. We aren't going to use that directly, but it's important to understand what loads they're designed to take originally before they're cut up. That will give us some guidance as we do our structural design. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the terms for a shipping container. So we're all speaking the same language. We all know what we're talking about. And I'm going to leave this slide up for a little bit so you can actually look through this. And I'll guide you through the different parts. Now one of the odd things is the front of the container is this end, not the door end. I always, when I started on this, thought the door end was the front. But no, when this is loaded up on a truck, this is the end that faces towards the front. So the front end is the end without the doors. So these corners here are called the front corners. They're specific pieces that make up the front corners. This piece here that the side panels and the top panels are welded to is called your top rail. Your door posts are here at the door, obviously. Our corner castings are on all four corners of the container. These are important as we're erecting it. Now, when we get inside the container, we have it's uh, either a apatong type of plywood, which is um, a, a mahogany type of material. It's very hard and very dense. Or a bamboo floor is what a number of containers are coming out with now because it's a cheaper material, more environmentally friendly to use bamboo. And then underneath that floor, we have steel channels, which are cross members. They're known as the bottom cross members. And then we also have a gooseneck, which is important when it's loaded up on the truck because the hitch for the trailer to the truck slides up underneath the gooseneck. This allows the hitch to fit in here without interfering with how the container is loaded on the trailer. Now I'm going to cover corner castings in particular for a second here because we're going to find these are very important as we're erecting the containers. These are cast steel. They all are the same dimensions. The holes are all the same. Everything is exactly the same no matter who manufactures the container. The corner castings are exactly alike. This is important so we can buy commercial type construct. Uh, connectors and fit them in the container no matter who manufactures it. No matter what the length of the container is, we can use the same connectors to hook them together. That makes our erection of the building very simple. And here's the standard for the dimensions, which is actually quite handy when we get into drafting to draft an accurate 
depiction of the corner casting since this drawing is so detailed. Okay, let's do a short history on modular buildings and we'll also cover how containers got introduced as modular buildings. Okay, now what's, why do we want to build with a modular building? We can, first off, we can fabricate them in a controlled environment. We don't have to put the building together on a shipping, I mean on a job site where it's raining, snowing, freezing, hot, whatever. So you can fabricate much more comfortably and much faster since you aren't dealing with all those things working against you. You don't have to worry so much about theft. One of the big problems in construction sites and urban areas is people break in and steal stuff. They will steal everything, even in suburban areas, even in urban areas. They can break in, steal equipment, materials, just about everything you can think of. There's also space issues, especially in an urban environment. You don't have a whole lot of room to work in. And if you are using a modular building, you've got a dedicated area with the space that you need. Because the efficiency, it's the labor costs can be cheaper. You're spending less time on site. And if you're in a very high security installation, you don't have to bring in so many people. And you don't have to... When you work in a high security installation, the workers you bring in have to be supervised often by security personnel, and that adds to the cost. Now, there are disadvantages, which we're going to cover later on, too. They're often confused with mobile homes. This is the biggest headache you have with community opposition. People think you're putting a trailer park in. There are architectural limitations. The architecture must function, and what the modules can realistically, with what the modules can realistically do, you can only carry a module that's so wide down a highway. That makes uh, open spaces for a building much more expensive because you you don't have the freedom to design the structure as you normally would, and then you get resistance on the construction from code officials. They want to see stuff put together on site so they can go out and do their inspections. The other alternative is to get the building certified as a modular building, but that locks you into a certain design of the building. It's also time consuming, and since it has to be a specific design, you don't have much architectural freedom at all. Who builds with shipping containers? These are some of the major players that I found in the Middle East, Europe, and the U.S. and Canada. There's also a number of companies that are appearing up and down in China. I didn't get into them because uh, there's so many of them and they change all the time. One of the things I have to point out is a lot of companies that I have dealt with that's attempted to build with containers are no longer in business. Why did this happen? I'm going to use three reasons that I saw. The first thing, and this is hard, lack of expertise. In conventional building, we've got hundreds, if not, you know, maybe a couple of thousand years of institutional knowledge how to build. Masonry block have been built with since Babylonian times. Uh, timber construction has been used for thousands of years. This has given us a lot of institutional knowledge, a lot of experience with how to put up these type of buildings shipping containers. There is not that kind of experience. So everybody starting out has to figure it all out from scratch. Lack of cost control. This probably goes back to lack of expertise too. People are too optimistic. I know of one company in particular that won a lot of federal contracts. It based its bid on I don't know. They didn't do any pricing out of the cost. They just made up numbers that they thought would win the bid. And they won a lot of bids, but they lost money on every single project they did. They lost a serious amount of money. They went out of business. The other thing that I've seen at companies is they got private investors to pay for building the buildings, but they grossly underestimated the cost of the building. The investors had to put in a lot more than they expected, 
and cut the funding for future projects. Overextension. A number of companies have taken on projects attempting to build every shipping container project all across the country. You can't do it. You can't build a project over in New Mexico if you're located in Maryland very effectively because it takes too long to get there. You can't effectively supervise your staff. And that has caused a number of these companies to have serious issues. What I've seen with the ones that went down in a major way is all three combined. That's usually how it works in disasters anyway. There's usually more than one component of a disaster. Now we're going to get into the history of modular buildings. We're going to start off with all buildings. And uh, we'll start off with the late 19th century. More than likely before then there was modular buildings built, but this is when we first started going about it in, in a major way. The Sears Roebuck Company came up with an idea to provide kits for houses. You got everything you needed. The plans were provided. The stuff would be shipped to you by rail. You'd bring it to your where you're building your home, and everything's there. You didn't have to go hunting around for windows. You didn't have to go to the local sawmill and hope they had the lumber and the size and the dimensions that you needed, which a lot of times they didn't. If you go in old buildings here in Atlanta, you'll find all sorts of different lumber sizes and houses that were built prior to like 1915 because you just happened to get what the lumber yard or the sawmill really had that day. Here you had sta everything standardized. You just put it together. Saved a lot of money and you'll find these houses still standing in downtown areas, older residential areas, and many cities through the country. They're still looking in pretty good shape. Now, World War I, a lot of soldiers were mobilized. You can't keep people in tents all the time. Tents have a number of serious issues as far as weather, um, moisture, they deteriorate very quickly and they don't provide a very good environment for shops, offices, or sleeping uh, over a long term. So the Neeson hut was developed in Great Britain. Pretty simple design basically, just corrugated metal and a semicircle. Built the ends of it, doors and windows, and there you go. Put a concrete floor in. Very simple building and they're still standing today which shows that it was a pretty good idea. In World War II, the Neeson Hut was modified in the United States to become the Quonset Hut, and these appeared everywhere. And there's still versions of this that are still build, being built, um, and they're very, very good design as far as the semicircular shape sheds water very well, and they can modify for any number of uses. After World War II, there was a big shortage of houses with all demobilized soldiers getting married and starting families. Here's one here that was made from precast concrete in Great Britain. And this is where we started the prefab housing business. And then we're going to get into the one that's what's going to cause us trouble now with shipping containers. And that is the mobile home. This was a good idea. Because you could build a house very inexpensively in a factory, haul it on wheels to its site where it was going on to, remove the hitch, remove the wheels, chalk it up, and you've got a house, instant house. And these were very popular for low-cost housing, for people that were beginning to have families working in factories, working the entry-level jobs. They could afford a house instead of renting an apartment. It was a pretty good deal for everybody. The problem is, is what you see on the right. A mobile home is built cheaply, obviously, to make it cheap for the people buying it. It has maybe a 10 to 15 year lifespan before it starts to deteriorate seriously. The siding starts to buckle, it oxidizes, the windows are cheap, the finishes are cheap, everything starts falling apart. The skirts underneath start to get dented up and the neighborhood goes downhill. The original people that moved in move out. They probably moved out long ago to a, a more permanent home in a house. Maybe they've moved to another mobile home park with a newer mobile home, but they're gone and then transients come in and very quickly the mobile home park becomes blight, crime, extreme poverty, and all the social problems. 
and will build with containers. That's what everybody's afraid is going to happen. While there have been met, been some shipping containers used to some permitted building storage sheds, in my research, I'm finding that the first permanent buildings didn't appear till the early 2000s. First major build, permanent building that I can find was Container City One, built in London in 2001. Also in 2001, after 9/11, the U.S. military deployed a huge number of personnel over to the Middle East and Central Asia. Central Asia was a problem with getting standardized modular buildings in place and it was difficult to haul in the modular buildings that the military had fabricated for deployed troops and they found they could buy from local suppliers buildings made out of shipping containers. Apparently the first permitted building in the United States was built by SG Blocks in Charleston, South Carolina. I haven't found any record of anything earlier than that. David Cross with SG Blocks believes he may have been the one to build the first permanent building. He's not sure completely, but he can't find anything before that project. In 2006, the Keat Wonen project was built in the Netherlands. That's built of a thousand containers. That's temporary housing that was built to house students in Amsterdam. And that project is for sale, by the way, if you want to buy it, because they've got to give the land back. All right. Let's talk about Container City, London in 2001. This is what it looks like. Pretty nice. Actually, it's down in the Docklands in London. Looks very nice with the way they work the architecture of the shipping containers. They some, stood some up on end. They cut a number of windows of different types of uh, dimensions and had circular windows to make it look more uh, uh, significant. I don't know what the good word is to describe that, but it's very attractive. Can't say the same of the buildings we had in Uzbekistan and Karshi Khanabad Air Base in 2002, but they're certainly better than trying to work out of tents for our different functions. They were weatherproof, they were quick to construct, and they were comfortable inside. These were built off-site, hauled in place, erected, and there we go. We're ready to go. The only problem we had with these was there was a lack of inspection as they were put together and the electrical work which tended to haunt deployed troops from that point forward was done very bad and we had a couple catch on fire on the inside of the walls. Later deployments of US troops had even worse things happen uh, in shower units where the poor grounding and poor electrical work caused a couple of soldiers to be electrocuted in the shower. Now we'll go to the next one. Okay, let's look at a couple of projects here. Here's the Keep Wonen project in the Netherlands that was built in 2006. And here's the home in North Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina. The house in North Charleston is a very simple house, low cost house built up on a crawl space. Nothing significant about it architecturally. The big significance is it's a permanent house made out of shipping containers. <clears throat> the Keep Wonen project, here you go. Here's all the units here. They were fabricated in China, brought to the port in Amsterdam, trucked into place, set in place, locked together, connected with the utilities, and they were ready to go. Okay, now let's go ahead through some significant container projects available. I'm going to, uh, examples, I mean, I'm going to talk about notable projects worldwide. All right, here's Container City One. This is a better, larger picture to see the Docklands project. As I said earlier, that may be the first major permanent shipping container project in the world, although there may have been something earlier, more minor project but I found no evidence of it. And again, we already saw the Keep Wonen project. This is an interesting project in Angola. This was workforce housing for the oil industry. Um, a lot of people during the 2000s were locating themselves in Angola, working with the oil industry. 
They needed housing, temporary housing that was suitable. And what was interesting about this project is because Angola has like zero exports, containers are just populating, uh, populating everywhere in the country. And you can pick up containers for about $500 a piece. Labor costs were very low in that country, so doing the modifications to the containers was very low. And erection was very simple. If you used more traditional building materials, they would have had to have been supplied from Europe or Asia. It would have been much more costly. This was a very inexpensive way to build, and it was also very fast. These uh, this housing went up quickly and provided suitable housing for workers that came from elsewhere to work in the oil fields. More permanent project that was built was the Seacon apartment building in Washington, D.C. This building, when it was going up, the very first day it was erected, hit the front page of the Washington Post. Every news uh, show and every television station in the Washington, D.C. area showed this throughout the day as it went up. It created a lot of excitement in Washington, D.C. The containers were connected using the standard commercial connector uh, fittings. The doors were used to support the exterior balconies that we have here. There is some columns and interior reinforcing to compensate for cutting away the sides. It's built on a conventional foundation. One of the weird things that we ran into I was the structural engineer of record on this job, was we had to leave portions of the original subwall of the house that was built in the 1920s. So behind all this stucco here is a clay block subwall, like this part I think is the original subwall. The rest of this is concrete. It became a structural nightmare. Fortunately, a good part of the subwall fell down as we were wrecked in the building and we didn't have to deal with it but it was something the city required of us. Now, this one was an interesting project, a restart project in Christchurch, New Zealand, 2011. Christchurch was hit by a major earthquake. A lot of buildings went down. It really devastated the city. And the psychological impact was severe too. This was a shopping mall that was completely knocked down. So they wanted to replace it as fast as possible to get commercial properties back up, to get the city operating again, and for the psychology of it, for people to see things were getting rebuilt. The city was functioning again. This was built very quickly. They started work on it without a building permit, but they knew that they had support from the council of the city. So they, they knew they could get away with that, get the permit after the fact, which they did. It was supposed to be a temporary replacement for the shopping mall it replaced, but it got so popular they have not been able to tear it down. And the issue that they've got now is waterproofing because they didn't expect it to be standing as long as it is in order to become a permanent structure. But they aren't being allowed to remove it now because it's so popular. So let's go on to the next one. This is a remote mining camp in Saskatchewan, Canada. It's built by 320 Modular. All these modules that you see here were fabricated in their shop in Saskatoon, loaded up on the trucks, hauled to the site and erected. This site's not so bad. Uh, you can actually get to it during the summer. Most of the sites they dealt with, you, there's no way to get there in the summer. You can only get there in the winter when the ground freezes and they build the ice roads to get up there. Um, even though th this site is accessible compared to some of the others they've been to, your building season outside is very limited because you have a very short summer and you have exceedingly cold winters up there. Building modular allowed them to build these containers, fabricate these containers during the winter in their shops, take them out and erect them during more temperate times, the short period of summer that they get. Uh, also, you can actually erect them during the winter. You don't that, need that many people out on the job site to put them together, and you're basically just lick, lifting them into place and locking them together. Now, what we're going to go into is how do you actually build a shipping container building? 
I'm going to talk about some typical materials and methods that I've seen used. First step, obviously, modify the shipping container. This is done in the shop. Cut out the sides as you need to, reinforce it, cut out your windows as you need to, reinforce them. Next step, take them to the site and lift them into place. Now, what you have to have ready is your foundations. Here's the Seacon building in DC. See, we've got our columns here and our plates to set the containers on. This is the biggest headache of putting the container building in place, is locating the first layer. As you can see, you've got to kind of shift them around and manhandle them. Here you see the guy with the pry bar moving the container into the right position. It's very difficult. We've talked about at times putting in container connectors on the base plates. But to do that, make it work, you've got to be exceedingly precise with how you put them down. And if you miss, you've caused a serious problem that you can't get around too easily when you bring the containers to the site. So we've always elected to just manhandle the containers into place. It's a pain in the neck, but it's probably not as bad as if we put the container connectors on the plates and hope we put them in the exact right spot. All right, now once we've put the first layer of containers in place, the rest is easy. You just bring them in, got your stack of container connectors right here, put them in the lower layer, stack the containers on top, and lock them together. Now you see this wood that we've got here? That's to provide a shim between this lower side rail and the upper side rail of the container below. What we've done is there's an opening down here, but the side rail below is reinforced. This deflects onto the wood, which acts as a shim, and the reinforcing below provides most of the strength. It keeps us from having to spend a lot of money on reinforcing the containers. Now, just to show a little bit about this vertical and horizontal connectors, very simple to install. They're all tested. They're all fabricated for you. You just purchase them commercially. The side-to-side -side connector is very easy to install and can be locked in place. It is the best way to put your containers in place. If you don't use the connectors, you're not going to accurately stack them, and that starts to get to be a problem if you've got containers that are three stories and more stories high, and also if you're more than three wide, the minor adjust a minor errors that you make in stacking start to add up and can cause you some serious problems if you don't use the connectors. Now after you've erected the containers, you have to go back in and do the interior finishing. You can do a lot of interior finishing before you bring the containers on site. Problem is, is the resistance to the local code officials and also just the practicality of putting some of the stuff in remotely. Plumbing. See, we're stacking plumbing in here. How do you connect the plumbing of this upper container to the plumbing in the lower container? You could build a chase between the two of them, but then you're starting to pump yourself up against the height restrictions of the container building with the zoning in the city, and you're adding to the expense of construction. So you're almost stuck with having to put in the majority of your plumbing once you get on the site. Same holds true of your ductwork, penetrating through the top and the bottom. How do you connect it accurately? The other issue is the code officials want to do their inspections on site to make sure everything looks right. You might be able to get permission to do, use a third party to do your code inspections off site, but in most cases you're going to have to come in and do your uh, erect, uh, interior finishing on site so the code officials can see it. The other issue is if you put in your windows before you bring the containers on site, you run into the chance that the windows will break while you're transporting it. Now in this structure, we put the balconies in after they were put on site. Uh, no, I'll correct that. The balconies were put in before we hauled them to the site. They're simply welded here as a cantilever. They're designed to actually cantilever out from here at the end, but we're also supporting the ends on the doors. So we have a redundancy in the structure.
for safety reasons. Obviously, we don't want our balconies to fall off. Why do you build with containers? Well, speed. In Uzbekistan, from the time we ordered a container building to the time it showed up and it was erected and ready to use, it's about 45 days. The Army Corps of Engineers at the same time was building barracks on the installation using uh, what was, it was a cat hut type of design, which was Central American Tropical, which was based on the Southeast Asia hut, which was used in Vietnam. And they seemed to think because it worked in Vietnam and in Central America, it would work in Central Asia, where unlike those two places, you can't get lumber. And of course, they kept moving forward, like the Army Corps of Engineers tends to do. And they bought lumber in Russia, which was not kiln dried. And it had to be shipped to Uzbekistan, where they set up a kiln to dry the lumber. And then they discovered that the Uzbeks had never built with timber to any extent, so they had to train Uzbeks in rough framing so they could get the building up. And it, it just went downhill from there. So when I was on site, they had the basic framing somewhat complete, and six months had gone by, and they weren't moving anywhere at all with any kind of speed. The SECON project in Washington, D.C., we began the design in March 2014, mid-March 2014, and that was the day we started design. The building was complete in September 2014. I've never seen a similar size building designed and constructed that fast. I'm amazed we got through the permitting process that fast. It was uh, it took a lot of walking stuff through and answering permit officials as quickly as we possibly could. The SECON building cost about $155 a square foot. Now, this is important to look at the cost. This is according to the project architect Kelly Davids. Uh, she told me comparable conventional construction in Washington DC is about $225 a square foot. Conventional construction here in Atlanta per square foot in the city is a little bit cheaper than that, probably on the order of about $175 a square foot. The two container houses built here in Atlanta cost about $150 a square foot, so there was still a price differential even in this low cost area for construction. All right, continuing while we build with containers. Well, as I covered earlier, it's easier to build in remote sites. Here's one of the buildings from 320 Modular being hauled off to somewhere further up north. And, you know, you have areas which you can't get to except for certain times of year. The site conditions being extremely harsh for the climate in North Canada and makes it difficult for construction. And since you're building in a shop, that takes away that problem. Also, with remote sites, if you're doing conventional construction, you've got to put all those personnel up there that are doing the construction. You've got to provide them a place to live. You've got to provide them transportation. It's very expensive. And if we're doing work in secured facilities like, let's say, a refinery or a military installation, all the people you bring on site have to be cleared. They have to do criminal records checks. And then once they're on site, you have to have them escorted. And it's a big pain in the neck. If we're doing modular with containers, we bring in much fewer people. So it's much faster process of clearing. And there isn't so much work to provide monitoring of these personnel when they're on site. It makes it much easier. Strength. This is something that I have to cover. This house right here on the left was the first house we built in Atlanta. It was in 2007 we put it up. And right after it was completed, a tornado hit the neighborhood, damaged every single house on the street. Now, the tornado did not physically touch down on this street. If it had, I don't think the containers would have helped it too much. But the container, uh, the Tornado passed overhead, ripped off roofs, ripped off siding, broke windows, and all that stuff. Did nothing to this building. Nothing at all. The only house in the neighborhood not damaged. So these are very good to put up 
in areas where we've got a risk of intense storms or earthquakes. Also, they can take a significant amount of overpressure from a blast, which makes them good in petroleum processing or natural gas facilities because we don't have to do a lot of modifications to the buildings to make them blast resistant. And finally, we got the architectural novelty. These containers are up in what was an industrial area. This is all mill housing that's around here to much up to the south here is uh, old warehouses that are being converted into lofts, old mills that are being converted into lofts. They fit in very nice with the industrial look of the neighborhood. And because of the unusual look to them, they're very popular among people that want a house that stands out. There are disadvantages. There's not much uh, freedom for the architect in the layout. That eight foot wide, the uh, connectors, doesn't give them a whole lot of space planning flexibility. And the kitchens, the bathrooms, floor to floor have to stack up on top of each other so we can run the plumbing down because running the plumbing horizontally is difficult to meet the requirements for slope and have the room to do it. Some localities, low cost construction localities, you don't have any advantage of costs and you're actually cheaper to go with conventional construction. And the final thing which I've found is one of the biggest problems is community resistance. The community finds out the shipping containers are coming in to make a building and they think it's going to look like this example that I took out of an ebook I bought. The guy that built this was quite proud of it. I don't know if his neighbors feel the same way but I, it looks like he doesn't have any neighbors, so that's okay, I guess. But you put that up in any urban area or suburban area, and people are gonna be very, very upset. Okay, our future trends. Where are we gonna go in the future with shipping container construction? The most optimistic person I spoke to was Kelly Davies, project architect to Travis Price Architects in Washington. Kelly is of the opinion that containers are going to be the new medium that we're going to use for common construction in urban areas. Um, she, her words, it's the go-to materials, the new brick and block of what we'll see in major metropolitan areas. Companies in, such as Power Secure that I work with in North Carolina are using containers to hold emergency power generators and switch gear since they can be moved into place quickly in case of an emergency. This could be very important in the future as global warming is causing ever more extreme weather events. And also containers are being used as facilities housing data centers to hold servers and other equipment for remote data. They're modular so they allow scalable facilities and they're secure. I think we're going to see more of that with large data companies using these for their server farms. What do I think? My personal opinion after working with container building since 2007 is as follows. In the near term, next 10 to 20 years, container buildings for urban projects are probably going to be somewhat limited because of the lack of experience in building with these and community opposition because people are confusing them with mobile homes. There will be continued growth in the usage of modular facilities that are going to have to be moved and erected quickly, obviously because ease of assembling them. I think we're going to see that continuing on and a good amount of growth there. And I also think we're going to see them used for critical facilities with areas with high seismic or wind loads because of their inherent strength. And I should say also in areas that are more temperate climates too, for facilities that are extremely critical, such as data centers, where you have to have physical security and absolute security for extreme climate events. Now, if I was present, I'd ask you, do you have any questions? But I'm not here with you, so I can't have you ask me questions but you can email me. Here's my email address and there's my telephone number. I'll leave it up for a few minutes so you can write it down and you can give me a call or send me an email with your questions. Please be specific with your questions. Don't ask me a question like, what do you think of container construction? Ask me something I can actually answer. 
Now, final slide. I want to thank the following people for their help, and I want to say their names because these people were very helpful to me when I called them on the phone. David Cross of SG Blocks, Quentin DeGugier, I hope I pronounced that last name right. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Over in Amsterdam, he was very helpful telling me about the Cute Wonen project in Amsterdam, spoke to me at length about it, gave me a lot of information. Noah Pascal Al Chaim in Tel Aviv, Israel. I've been working with Noah for years and she was very helpful in this paper. Eric Burrs of the Beacon Group in Christchurch, New Zealand. I asked Eric a number of questions by email about his project. He was very timely, gave me some very detailed information about that project. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. And Evan Willoughby of 320 Modular in Saskatoon, Canada. I've been working with Evan on projects since probably back in 2008. We've done a lot of projects together in Alberta and Saskatchewan provinces in Canada. So again, thank you all. And uh, that ends our slide presentation.